Uh, good day, everyone. I'm guessing that for most of you, it's uh, it's good evening. Um, so I hope you've had a peaceful day and you're having a, a relaxing evening. What I'm going to do is uh, over the next 30 minutes to provide you with uh, an introduction to football, um, which I hope you will find interesting. Uh, there are some really dramatic things happening right now in Europe, literally as we uh, as we speak and meet here today. So I will touch upon those uh, um, issues in a, in a short while. But what, I, but what I'm going to do, what I'm going <laughs> so please can you mute your microphone if your microphone is open thank you okay so what we what we are going to do is uh um have a 30 minute presentation then there will be an opportunity for for questions afterwards so let me begin by by sharing my uh my screen which We start with here. So my name is uh, Professor Simon Chadwick. I work for EM Lyon Business School. Uh, at the moment, I am based in Britain, about one hour north of London. Um, this is where my normal house is because of the pandemic. I'm working in uh, Britain. But normally you would find me in, in Paris, um, where our campus uh, that delivers the MSc in sport is based. And let me begin by showing you a photograph. And this photograph is a, a very important photograph for me personally. And let me talk a, a little bit about this photograph and, and hopefully you can see my cursor here. Um, in this town, this is a hospital. Okay, this is where the children in this town are born. This is a school. This is the main road in this town. So this is where the shopping malls are. This is where the banks are. You can probably see what it's so a one, two, three churches here. And then up in the background here, this is a cemetery. This is where dead people are buried. So in this town, you're born, you go to school, you work and then you die. And in the middle of this town, in the middle of all of this is a football stadium. And what's really important about this football stadium is in this house, this is where I lived when I was a boy. OK, so from a very, very early age, when I went to live in this house. When I went to live in this house, I was one year old. So every day when the curtains were opened or when I went to school, the first thing that I saw was a football stadium. So, of course, this meant that when I was a very young boy, um, I played lots and lots of football. And for those of you who are wondering, yes, this is me. This is me. I, I guess in this photograph, I must have been maybe five years old. Uh, as you can see, I had my school shirt and my school shorts. Uh, so they, they, this is uh, this is me playing football. So from the origins of living opposite a football stadium, I then started to play football a lot. And where I now find myself in the, the position is that most of the work that I do uh, is based around sport. Um, but particularly football. Um, so far today, so at the, at the moment, it's it's just after midday in the UK. So I've been working since about quarter to eight this morning. So for the last four and a half hours, all of my work has been football related. As you can see, uh, I am the professor of Eurasian sport uh, in Paris but I'm also the director of the Center for Eurasian Sport in Shanghai as well. So I'm a regular visitor to, to China. I, uh, I've been coming to China for nearly 15 years. Um, the last time I was in China was just before the pandemic. So in December, 2019, 
when I visited Changzhou. Uh, so I spend a lot of time in China. And I also spend a, um, a, a lot of time in, in uh, not just in China, but also watching the Chinese Super League and thinking about Chinese football and also considering, contemplating, um, will China host the World Cup, which I personally think it will. You'll see I also work uh, in um, a couple of other schools in, in China. So I'm a visiting professor in, in Tsinghua in Beijing. And I also have a very close relationship with Beijing Sport University. And alongside that too, you'll see that I, I work on a regular basis with um, these organizations in football. In fact, tomorrow, uh, I'm gonna be working with UEFA tomorrow. Um, so this is a relationship with UEFA that, that has been a very long one and, and, and I continue to work very closely with them. So for me personally, Football is very important. And for those of you who, who like football, you enjoy um, playing it or thinking about it or writing about it, or you want to study it, um, I would say to you, it's a very interesting and a very important area of activity. And for those of you who've got parents and your parents say to you, forget about football and do a, do a proper job, um, can I can I say to you, my PhD was on football shirt sponsorship. So I spent five years studying um, football shirt sponsorship for, for, for my doctoral studies. So I became a doctor on the basis of football. Now, as I was getting ready for the uh, for the presentation this morning and, and, and I, I inserted this slide as a very late uh, addition into the presentation, some of you who are fans will know that over the last 12 hours, proposals have been announced for a European Super League to be created, consisting of six Premier League clubs, English Premier League clubs, uh, three clubs from Spain and three clubs from Italy. And there are also some rumours, too, that French clubs will join. And instead of playing in the Champions League, what they will do is they will play in a Super League. Now, whether or not this is true... We still don't know, but I thought it was important to illustrate that that in this area, in this sport and in this field of the business and management of football, things are changing all the time. And for those of you who have a big interest in the sport and you have a big interest in the business and management of the sport, then I would recommend that over the next 24 to 48 hours, you spend some time um, following this story it's a really big story and if you're really interested at 5 p.m tonight so later on this afternoon so 5 p.m uk time i will be going on china global tv network to talk about this story so if you're still awake and if you have if you have access to the english language version of the China Global TV Network. You'll, you'll see me at 5 p.m. UK time talking about this story. So let's, uh, let's begin and, 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 and get to the main issues around what I've been asked to, to talk to you about today. And I take this right to the basics. And the first thing I do as an academic when I'm asked to give a presentation is to, 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 to think about fundamental terms. So I was asked to talk about football. So I'm, I'm therefore starting out today by asking, what is football? Because football is actually lots of different things. So football could be 11 versus 11. Some of you will be familiar with futsal. And for the likes of UEFA, futsal is really important. And I think in, in mainland Europe, futsal is very popular. Uh, if you're in Britain, five-a-side football is much more important than futsal. So five-a-side football is, uh, uh, is, is similar to, but actually significantly different from futsal. You also have various other versions like street football, cage football, beach football. And so you need to, to, uh, to, to think about the differences there. There's obviously male football. There's female football. Um, there's also football at the elite professional level. So Real Madrid and Manchester United and Juventus. But then, then there's also football at grassroots level. 
the kind of football that's played in schools or the kind of, the kind of football that is played by um, amateurs at the weekend. So as you go away from the presentation here today, what I want you to keep in mind is, is football is a very generic term. In reality, there are lots of different types of football, lots of different versions of football. And it's really important to understand the similarities and differences between them because this dictates the business, the, the, the management, the leadership challenges that each of them faces. So for instance, if you're, um, if you're a manager of the commercial team, at Real Madrid, for example, you're operating globally, you've got fans all over the world, you're on TV somewhere pretty much every day. Um, the kind of business challenges facing Real Madrid are going to be very different to, for instance, a small school team playing in a local league. It's not on TV. Uh, it doesn't have big money from commercial income. You know, clearly, it doesn't have star players from all over the world. It just has local school children. So they, the issues and challenges around running those kinds of teams in football are very different to running the kinds of teams that we've seen with, as I say, Real Madrid and, and, and the China national team and all of these other different, different types of, of, of teams and football that you can see. So let me bring my presentation up below. So I'm actually operating off two screens here. So I apologize if I'm looking at you here and then I'm looking down like this, it's because I've got two screens and the screen below had just gone to sleep. So I, I apologize for that. So for those of you who are football fans or for those of you who aspire to, to be part of the football industry, then I draw your attention to a very simple picture like this, because I think for many of us, football is the, the players on the pitch, whether they're men or women, young or old, local or national or international, you know, watching the game is a very important part of, 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 the, uh, of the game. However, as this picture shows, this is actually a, a photograph taken at Wembley Stadium in London, which is one of the biggest um, stadiums in the world. It, it, it holds uh, approximately 80,000 people. Um, there are all kinds of issues there. You know, in a stadium like this, getting people safely into the stadium and then safely out again is a big issue. Where these people eat and drink during the game is a big issue. What kind of seats they're sitting in, whether they're permitted to stand, what happens on those screens either side of the uh, the pitch? You'll see some screens uh, behind the goals on each of these uh, uh, in this photograph. That in itself is a, an important decision. Who provides the floodlights that light the stadium? Which companies are involved in constructing the stadiums? These are all really big parts of the industry that people need to be aware of. So essentially what I'm doing for the purposes of this presentation is, is to make a distinction between what we might call on the field business management and leadership and off the field business management and leadership. And when we talk about on the field, what we're talking about is players and teams and coaches and managers. So very often these people are, um, you know, they're, they're, they're just people like us, they're, they're human beings and, and they're motivated by certain things. They have attitudes that are created in certain ways. And then they have behaviors that they demonstrate. You know, they're just like us, motives, attitudes, behaviors. But how we manage those people to perform successfully and effectively in a playing environment requires particular skills. It requires particular knowledge. Similarly, off the field, we've already talked about extensively there about some of the things, you know, managing stadiums, managing tickets, managing food and beverage services. These are all very important parts of the off the field activity of, 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 uh, of, of football clubs, of football teams, of football organizations. So if we start with on the field, I think what's really interesting about on the field is what we have here is a player 
Some of you may know this player. He is Raheem Sterling of uh, Manchester City. But I ask you to, to look carefully at, uh, at this photograph because what you will also be able to see in this photograph is, is the Nike symbol. And, and we know that Nike is the kit supplier, or used to be the kit supplier, it's now Puma to Manchester City. You may also be able to see in the background uh, the name Nissan, the Japanese car manufacturer. You'll see the ball has got stars on it. So we know that the, the star ball is the symbol of, of the UEFA Champions League. We'll also see, we also see Etihad Airways, which is the name on the shirt, the advertisement on the shirt. Etihad Airways is the, uh, the national airline of Abu Dhabi. You might also be able to see on that star ball, the Adidas symbol. Uh, because Adidas has an official partnership with uh, uh, with, uh, with UEFA, because as you may be able to see in the background, this is a UEFA Champions League game. So just in this photograph as well, there's an awful lot of things going on, but what we're particularly interested in is this guy, Raheem Sterling. And the reason that we're interested in players, and it's not just Raheem Sterling, it could be Cristiano Ronaldo, or it could be uh, Lionel Messi, or... Uh, or it could be a, a female player like Megan Rapinoe, for example. It could be a player from um, Shanghai Shenhua. Or it could be a, a, a player from Guangzhou. It could be a player from Chongqing. But ultimately, on, on the field, it all involves the same thing. So football is a talent business. And one of the big on-field challenges... <laughs> please excuse me. One of the big on-field challenges for football clubs, football teams, football organisations, is to um, ensure that they acquire, retain and develop the best possible talent. So at a very early stage, what any football club has to do, what any football team has to do, is try to spot talent when it's young. Because if you can spot Lionel Messi when he's 10 years old, or if you can spot the next Cristiano Ronaldo when he's eight years old, and you can sign that talent first and you can develop that talent, and that talent then goes on to be a big international superstar that helps you win games, that helps you sell replica shirts, then obviously this is gonna benefit your team. But you'll also notice in there, I talk about disposal. Because inevitably what happens with all teams is a player leaves the team, a player leaves the club. So in the case of Ronaldo, we know that Ronaldo went from Sporting Lisbon to Manchester United to Real Madrid to Juventus. There are stories now that Ronaldo might leave Juventus and, and go to the United States. But um, a senior manager a senior leader inside a football club will need to make that decision about when is the best time to dispose of this talent asset. Before you do that, though, you're, you're managing Ronaldo, you're managing Messi, you're managing Megan Rapinoe. And, and what you're trying to do is to create teams and to coach those teams to be successful very often using data nowadays, so therefore analysts are important with the view of winning, with the view of winning matches. And I think what's really interesting about football on the field right now is increasingly teams are looking towards very well-educated people to work with talent. So to go back to the, uh, the previous photograph that I showed you of Raheem Sterling, some of you will know that uh, Manchester City is, is coached by Pep Guardiola. Pep Guardiola has a, a team of 39. I'll say that again. Pep Guardiola has a team of 39 data analysts. So he has 39 people working for him who generate and analyze data for him about the performance of his teams. The director, the director of performance analysis at Manchester City is a Harvard graduate. 
Okay, so this is this is a business, this is an industry, this is a sport that is increasingly populated by very well educated, um, uh, very well educated, intelligent people. Now, at the same time, what you've also got. So whilst Pep Guardiola has got his 39 analysts looking at how players play, there is then a huge team very often at Manchester United, at Juventus, at Bayern Munich, at Paris Saint-Germain, who are also managing and leading and monitoring performance off the field. So, for instance, in the, in the area of tickets, one of the big challenges facing any football club or facing any football team is the sale of tickets. And, and, and clearly during the pandemic, this has been a really big issue because it, it, the, 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 um, the inability to sell tickets during the pandemic because of uh, restrictions has impacted upon the finances of many clubs across the world. And that has been a big challenge. That's, that's been a big challenge for, for marketing managers at clubs. It's been a big challenge for financial managers at clubs. It's been a big challenge for commercial directors, for digital directors. And so you begin to get a sense then of what are some of the things that, that, that people off the field are doing? So off the field, Essentially, what you're trying to do is to create sustainable clubs or to create sustainable teams. So in other words, they're sustainable. They have a long term future. They're financially stable. Um, they're generating revenues and, and certainly at elite professional level. You know, if we're thinking about those big teams that we've already talked about, we know their players are on huge salaries millions of, 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 of pounds, millions of dollars every year. We also know that transfer fees are huge. Some of you will know that Neymar, when he, uh, uh, when he signed for Paris Saint-Germain from Barcelona, the transfer fee was in excess of $200 million. So there's a big onus. There's a big onus on these off-field professionals financial managers, marketing managers, and so forth, to generate revenues and to um, contribute to the long-term long sustainability of clubs and teams. So what they're looking at is, is they're looking at relationships with fans and engaging fans. They're looking at how best to utilize stadiums and venues. And as some of you will know, you know if we take uh, um, if we take Tottenham Hotspur Stadium for example, uh, this costs seven hundred in excess of seven hundred million pounds to create. And inside there, there are restaurants and bars and cafes and conference facilities, meeting rooms. So these venues are not just match day venues; they are seven days a week. Uh, 365 days a year, they're generating revenues from such assets. And all of this very often is directed towards ensuring financial sustainability. Now, what I've done there quite a lot is I've talked quite a lot about elite professional football. I've talked quite a lot about men's football. I have I've mentioned women's football once or twice, and I, I talked about Megan Rapinoe. But I've essentially talked about elite professional men's football. But of course, elite professional men's football is not the only type of football that exists as we've, we've already uh, talked about. And, and we then get into thinking about, well, OK, if this is a football club and these are the different types of organisation, on-field and off-field organisation around that football club, what is the purpose of the club? And I think if we take the third point down there uh, for economic and commercial reasons, we, we, we talk about Real Madrid and Bayern Munich and Juventus and these kinds of, of, of teams. They, they exist nowadays principally for economic, commercial and financial reasons. But we also know that clubs exist for socio-cultural reasons. In fact, if you go back to the origins of many football clubs in Europe and South America, they were set up for socio-cultural reasons. They were set up 
to bring communities together. And even if you go somewhere like Qatar, and as you will know, Qatar is hosting the World Cup next year in 2022, um, there's a big emphasis upon the socio-cultural benefits of playing football. It gives people a sense of togetherness. It brings them together. It gives them a, a feeling of shared identity, of shared purpose. So I think you've also got to think about you know, why, why would you establish a football club? Well, for socio-cultural reasons, not just to make money, maybe for socio-cultural reasons. Or you may set up a football club for health and welfare reasons. So we know that physical activity is, uh, is very important. We know that people who run around and exercise regularly um, have better physical health, they have better mental health. But I think it's also important too to stress that football is a source of skills development for many people. So you learn how to be part of a team. You learn how to make decisions. You learn how to make quick decisions. You learn how to lose. You learn how to win. So therefore, in terms of health and welfare, you, you may set up a football club for those health and welfare reasons. You may also set up a football club for political reasons. I've mentioned Paris Saint-Germain already. Uh, some of you will know that Paris Saint-Germain, the French uh, first division, is actually owned by the Qatari government. We mentioned Manchester City. Manchester City is owned by the Abu Dhabi government. Um, and I think Football clubs, therefore, sometimes are, are owned for political reasons. So as you go away from here today, thinking about what is the purpose of football, why do football clubs exist? It could be for one of the reasons given here, but it could be for multiple reasons. It could be several of these reasons here. It could be for another reason that I've not even mentioned here. So what are my conclusions? Well, my conclusions are football's a great game. It's really good to watch. It's really good to play. It's been part of my life for a long time. And I think for all of you who have an interest in football, then fantastic and, and feel that love and feel that passion. But I think that passion is really important because then when you're beginning to think about your professional career, um, that passion will be really significant. We all, I think we all, all of us, if, if I'd said to my, my parents when I was uh, 21, I'm going to do a lot of work in football, my parents probably would have said to me, no, you're not. Get yourself a normal job. Get yourself a proper job. Stop dreaming. And I think that probably some of you out there, if you were to, to, uh, to, to talk to your parents this evening and say, mom, dad, I'm going to go work in football, your parents would say, forget it. Forget it. Go and be a doctor. Go and be an accountant. Go and be an engineer. But we live in a very different world. We're living in the 21st century. And there are huge, huge things happening to football around technology, around polit political change, around changes in consumer lifestyle, etc., etc. So football now and sport more generally is an absolute definite career option. I mentioned Pep Guardiola's uh, head of data analysis, a Harvard graduate. You have me, Simon Chadwick, a professor of sport. I have a PhD in football shirt sponsorship. Uh, tomorrow when I work with UEFA, coincidentally, the director of sponsorship at UEFA is, uh, is an EM Lyon Business School graduate. He, he, he graduated with a master's back in 2006. So nowadays, you can create a lifelong career, very high profile, lots of status, big salary, uh, making really important decisions, working in football. And so if, it is, if, it is a, a, if it's a, a sport that you care a lot about, if it's an industry that you want to be part of, then I would recommend to you that what you do is you, you do see um, football as not only a realistic program of study for you, but also a realistic career option as well.
students. And as I say, I've, I've got students, I've got some, I've, just very, very quickly, I've got some, some of my former students in UEFA, I've got some of my former students in FIFA, I've got former students working for the Chinese Super League, I've got former students working at Liverpool, at Manchester United, at Bayern Munich, uh, I've got some of my former students working in big sponsors like Sony and MasterCard, Coca-Cola, so you know, definitely, definitely, this is a very important and growing and hugely lucrative sport and industrial sector. At that point, I will say thank you for, uh, for listening. Uh, we've left some time for questions, which hopefully we can get to in a moment. For those of you who want to know more, uh, that's my WeChat QR code. You are welcome to, uh, to, to connect on WeChat. Um, and if there's anything that you want to uh, to, to, to know that, that I haven't talked about today, you can you can send me a, a WeChat message or alternatively, you can uh, you can email me. Um, but otherwise, as I say, thank you for listening. OK, I'm going to try now and stop my recording. So stop my sharing, should I say so? Um, I'm open to questions if people have questions. Okay, do we have questions uh, from the organizers? You have uh, questions that you want to ask? Hello. So you, hello? Sorry, I just have a question, uh, maybe two. Okay. So uh, the first is about financial stability. I don't know if you heard about, I'm sure you heard about the scandal of Suning, Suning Football Club in China due to the fact that the, the holding company is lack of cash flow, therefore the football club itself and went bankrupted, pretty much big scandal. And so I'm just concerned about if I, uh, if it's secure for me now for me to find a job in a football club and then all of a sudden, because of financial situation of a company, then I may lose my job. <laughs> and the second question is with regard to the first division AS Monaco club. Uh, if, uh, uh, how do you feel about working for that club based on your experiences? So two questions, sorry. <laughs> okay, no, I, and you know what, two really fantastic questions. Um, if I could take, obviously take the first question first. Uh, right. I, wow, I've been um, studying Chinese football for 20 years. And, and so what has happened over the last five years in particular has been uh, um, of incredible interest to me. And particularly what's been happening with Suning and, and, and as I'm sure you know, not, not just with Jiangsu, but also with, uh, with Inter Milan in Italy, we, 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 we read stories that, uh, that Suning might be about to sell into Milan, possibly to an American investor. So these, these are really interesting times, um, not, not just for, for people working at Suning and these clubs, but I think more generally, because what we're looking towards is to get a sense of, of, of what is the Chinese government and what is the Chinese Football Association? What are they, what are they trying to, to do long term with, with their investments in football? I think my view about uh, about what's happening with Suning is is that essentially Suning has been required to focus on its core business, and and what we know about Suning is its core business is is high street electrical retailing, and and I'm sure you also know that that Suning has a, a very owns a very successful esports team. So I think what we're going to see over over the the, the period, you know, the, the kind of next decade is Suning Suning focused on electrical retailing and Suning focused on esports. Now, in terms of what that means for uh, uh, Jiangsu Suning, well, obviously that's gone. We'll, 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 I think we will see a new club in in Jiangsu. Um, what my feeling is about Chinese football right now is that the government is creating the conditions for football rather than being sustained by a corporate benefactor so in other words rather than Jiangsu being sustained by Suning rather than Guangzhou being sustained by Evergrande uh, I think what the government is doing is to create the environment for those clubs to become self-sustaining and and what that means is 
you know, generating sponsorship revenues from global corporations in just the same way as other football clubs around the world does. And, and clubs, instead of looking towards their owners for money, they're, they're looking towards building fan engagement and ensuring that their stadiums are full of spectators. So my advice to you would not to not not to be afraid as a consequence of what's happened with, with Suning and Jiang Tzu, but to see this as an opportunity to be part of the, the next generation, the new generation of Chinese football, which I think is going to be based much more around the kinds of clubs that you do see in Europe. And, 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 I, and you know, in 10 years' time, I would expect to see well-managed Chinese clubs, commercially successful Chinese clubs, like Manchester United and Juventus and Real Madrid. So in other words, clubs that make big revenues, they, they generate revenues from broadcasting, from sponsorships. And, and for you, that's a real opportunity because it suggests that over the next 10 years, Chinese football needs people like you. It needs bright, young, hardworking, well-educated people with good ideas that they've perhaps learned by studying in Europe so that you can come back to China and make a contribution to the long-term health and sustainability of Chinese football. I think as far as Monaco is concerned, and that's a really interesting question because I, I don't know Monaco specifically. Uh, I know other French clubs um, and I know other European clubs. And I think what I would say about Monaco is, is that clearly um, it's a club with history and heritage. It, it, it is a club with a track record of success. We know that some of the best players and best managers in the world have been associated with, with Monaco over history. And I'm thinking about Arsene Wenger, for example, started out at Monaco. I'm also thinking about players like George Weah. And if you remember George Weah, George Weah started uh, uh, started out in Monaco. Uh, Liberian international Thierry Henry started out in Monaco. So this is this is a very important club. My view would be is there there would be an opportunity to build your career there. Um, certainly at the, you know, at, at the start or in the middle of your career, it would be a really interesting place to work. My, my reservation about Monaco would be is, is that Monaco is clearly not uh, Real Madrid or Barcelona or AC Milan or Bayern Munich or Manchester United. Um, so if you're looking to work for a truly global organisation, then that's probably not Monaco. Uh, but if you're looking to work for an organization with potential, then I think it would, would be a, an interesting and a, and a very nice club to actually start your career with. Perfect. I'm noticing that so you, you, there were really two really great questions. So thank you. Thank you for those questions. Um, another question is coming. Good morning, sir. Two questions. Firstly, how to cultivate football culture in China. I, I think that is uh, a really... <laughs> Really, really good question. Um, I'm, I suspect that today, and I, I don't know how many people we've got online, so it's saying that we have 45 attendees online. I'm going to make a prediction uh, that I am the oldest person here today. So out of the 45 people who are online right now, I'll, I, I think I'm probably the oldest person. And what I have learned from being old is um, to create a culture takes decades. To create a culture takes decades. To change a culture takes decades. And so one of the things that fascinates me about China and Chinese football, <coughs> excuse me, is that I think what, the Chinese government and the Chinese Football Association have tried to do is to is to fast track football, and there have been some successes, um, but there have also been some problems too. And if somebody from the Chinese Football Association was to be sat in front of me here right now, my advice that I would give to them is that. You, you, create a, you create a culture over decades, not over five year cycles. It may take 10 years, it may take 15 years, it may take 20 years. 
Now, interestingly, the Chinese uh, government has a, a, a vision of becoming a leading FIFA nation by 2050. So keep that in mind. The Chinese government wants China to become a leading FIFA nation by 2050. That's 30 years away. And I think that's exactly the kind of time horizon that you need to be looking at. Because within that, what you then start to do is, is really what, what China has already started to do. So you've got to, you've got to, for example, make sure that kids in schools are playing football every week. So when I was a kid, I played football every day. I certainly played football every week. And so what you have here in England, which I think is one of the most uh, passionate and deeply embedded football cultures in the world, is kids are playing football every single day. Um, certainly they're playing it every single week. They're in, they're, they're in school and they're playing. The interesting thing too is, is and, and, and I always find this very interesting, is it seems to me that Chinese parents, after school, Chinese parents, they want you to, they want you to, to, to play the piano. They want you to read books. They want you to um, do extra maths. They want you to study Chinese literature. You know, that's, what you, that's what they want you to do at night and at weekends. If you come to Europe, it's different. Because certainly in England, what, what many parents will do at night or at weekends is, that, is they'll, they'll, they'll take their kids to play football. And so I think one of the things that, that I, would, I would suggest also needs to happen, and, and this is a role for young people like you, is you've got to be saying to your mom, you've got to be saying to your dad, uh, to your grandparents, to your extended families, uh, there are some benefits to playing football. So one of the benefits of playing football is soft skills development. So in other words, is, is, is really um, you know, seeing the value of football in terms of creativity and decision-making skills and independent thinking and problem solving. You know, that's what football gave to me. And I think, this is something that, that um, Chinese parents and grandparents need to understand. So, you know, they've, they've got to give you the time at night and at weekends to play football, not just study, to play football as well. Now, you're asking me a, a second question there, if I could scroll back to it. Second, in your opinion, what is the main reason why a lot of Chinese football cannot be improved? What is the gap between Chinese football and European football? What's really, I, for me, what's really interesting is, is, is Japan. The very first time I went to Japan was in the early 90s. And at that stage, the J-League had just been established. And the J-League was really interesting because it was a, a collaboration between the Japanese football authorities, between industrial corporations, and also between local governments in different parts of Japan. So one of the first uh, one of the first clubs I ever went to visit in Japan was Gamba Osaka, and Gamba Osaka was really interesting because it was a, it was essentially a, a collaboration between the Kansai Prefecture, where Osaka is uh, located, also um, those involved with the football club but also the Sumitomo Corporation. So Sumitomo owns, for example, Panasonic. And what the, what the J-League and these organizations did was to set out uh, a vision over 25 years for how they wanted Japanese football to develop. And if you think about Japanese men's and women's football, they always qualify for the World Cup. And if you look at the women's team, the Japanese women's team is arguably the best or certainly one of the top five best in the world. If we think about uh, Japanese players, you know, it's, it's not uncommon for Japanese players to, to sign for Real Madrid or to sign for Manchester United. And so I think what we, what we, we learn from Japan is that it provides, I think, a better template upon which Chinese, Chinese football can be developed. Because in European football, is, you know, it, it's, got a, it's got 130, 140, 150 year history. Japanese football history is, is more contemporary. Um, but I think the, the, the crucial thing about Japan's contemporary football history is, is the planning, the planning times. 
So as I say, 25 year planning cycle, but also Japan is now a leading FIFA nation. So Japan has been able to do in 25 years what essentially China is trying to do over the next 30 years. So my view is, is that China can do it. You've got 1.6 billion people. You know, there are more people in Shanghai than there are in the, in the whole of Denmark, Holland, um, Belgium, Norway, put together. You know, Shanghai alone is a huge city. So I think you know, for me, what China is all about, it's about culture and getting the organization right. And you are making progress, but that progress will come over an extended period of time. So somebody is asking, hello, sir, I would like to know your opinion on recent creation of the European Super League. It hasn't been created yet. Hello. hello That's a very... Me? Yeah. Uh, hello. Uh, Dr. Dr. Chadwick, uh, I'm just uh, hearing that uh, UEFA is set to ratify a bigger... Uh, the bigger league format that uh, so that's uh, uh, so many uh, great teams are beginning to organize this uh, breakaway teams to start this super league um, uh, if this really happened uh, if, and, and if you are a member in a broadcast company or a sponsor what would you do okay so thank you for that question um so it's i guess it's alcott who's uh, sending these questions through um so for those of you who are uh, uh, unfamiliar with what i ha what is happening right now alcott have you got still got your microphone on could you mute your microphone thank you thank you alcott um so what is happening right now is that a proposal was was uh, leaked to the press yesterday um, which potentially might see a European Super League being created. So teams like Manchester United, Real Madrid, AC Milan, leaving their domestic leagues, leaving um, uh, uh, UEFA and setting up their own Super League. Now, the interesting thing about this is, is that, that breakaway competitions in different sports have happened before. So, for instance, in Formula One, there was a breakaway uh, uh, series um, suggested nearly 30 years ago now. So breakaway leagues are, are a constant part of the sporting landscape. That's that's the first thing. But this Super League potentially is, is big news because it would mean the 12 teams that are proposing the Super League, they would just play each other all the time. And, and, and I can conceive of these clubs... Manchester United, Manchester City, Liverpool, Chelsea, Tottenham, Arsenal, AC Milan, Inter Milan, Juventus, um, uh, Real Madrid, Barcelona. And they would come to China and play games. Uh, they would go to India and play games. They would go to Saudi Arabia and play games. They would go to the United States and play games. So this is, this is a big deal right now. But I do think that this is a response to UEFA proposals to reformat the Champions League. Now, UEFA has a very challenging job because on the one hand, UEFA needs the big clubs because it's the big clubs that make the money. So when you pay your subscription to watch a, a Champions League game on TV, um, that money is going in part to UEFA. So UEFA needs the big clubs because it needs them to make money. But at the same time, UEFA's job, UEFA's role is not just to look after the big clubs. UEFA's role is to look after smaller clubs in Gibraltar, in Hungary, in Czech Republic, in Estonia, in the Faroe Islands. And so UEFA constantly has to try and balance the big, the big teams with the smaller teams. And what UEFA is doing with their proposal for the new Champions League is, is what they think is, is a balancing act. But of course, what, what the big powerful clubs are doing is they're saying, we don't like that. We are the big clubs. We're the clubs that earn all the money. So therefore, UEFA, because we earn all of this money for you, we want you to give us more money. And, and so this is, I think, the Super League proposals at least for the time being, are an example of politics. It's uh, uh, the politics of, of UEFA and the politics of relationships between the big clubs in UEFA. And so the Super League hasn't been confirmed. 
It may be confirmed in the in the coming weeks or months, but I suspect that ultimately what we will get is a negotiated compromise involving UEFA and those big clubs. So keep watching. It's a really, really interesting, exciting story. It's about money and politics and digital technology and different countries. You know, who are the? You got to think. One of the things I think you got to keep keep in mind is. Who, who is invested into these clubs? So these 12 clubs, you know, who's, who, who, who gives the money to these clubs? Well, we know, you know in the case of Inter, the money is coming from China. We know in the case of uh, Manchester City, the money is coming from Abu Dhabi. We know in the case of Liverpool, the money is coming from the United States. So this is no longer about Europe and the European Champions League. This is about the whole world. This is about the interconnectedness of financial flows. It's about the, 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 the changing balance of economic power in the world. It's about changes in digital technology. So it's an incredible story, an exciting story, but it's a story that hasn't reached its conclusion yet. Okay, so a couple of other, uh, couple of other questions. What have we got? Hello, Professor. Hello. Hello. Yeah, can you hear me? I can. Yeah, good. I just got two questions. Uh, the first one is, you know, in the Chinese Super League, most of the clubs, or we can say the all of clubs, are losing money every year. So uh, what's the motivation for them to keep the club uh, wrong every year? And the second, uh, we know we have the FFP, which is the financial uh player regulation in Europe, can we apply this regulation in China? Is it suitable for China? Thank you for your questions. Um, so I think on, the, on your first question, and let me let me just write the, uh, the, the second one down so I don't forget it. So your first question about uh, financial sustainability, um, most clubs, most football clubs in Europe do not make a profit. So Chinese football clubs are not alone. So what we know is that football clubs anywhere in the world face intense cost pressures. And those intense cost pressures come in terms of uh, player transfer fees and player salaries. It's very difficult to, you, you, you can't, we can't say to Neymar, hey, Neymar, um, you know, don't get transferred to $200 million. You know, don't accept a salary of, of $400,000 a week. You know, don't do that. You know, and, and Neymar will say, okay, you're fine. I won't, you know, just, just pay me a little bit of money. I'm not bothered about being paid. But that's not how this works. So we know player costs are there. We, there's very little we can do to control those costs. So therefore, the big onus on, on clubs in Europe is to generate revenue. And this is why, you know, as you will know in China, this is why these teams come to you know, Juventus and United and these others, this is why they come to China, because they want your money. And they, they want you to spend on their clubs because ultimately they're trying to balance their books, if not make a profit. I think what we do know is over the last 10 years in particular, is with good management, with professional management, uh, football clubs can make a profit. And those clubs that we, we've talked about already, Liverpool and Manchester United and some of those others, they make a profit. Um, and, and so to answer what the first of your, your questions is, the challenge for you in, in China is to, I think, is to worry less about cost because cost is, is actually quite difficult to control in football and to think more about how do you generate revenue. The second uh, question you asked was about financial fair play. Um, and I think financial fair play is you can do what you want to do. If you want to introduce financial fair play into Chinese football, you can do that. And, and clearly with some of the, the salary controls that you've introduced now um, in, in China, now, this is entirely in keeping with trying to exercise some control over costs, but also um, change attitudes towards revenue generation as well. So in these terms, I think, uh, again, China has taken a very 
important and a very bold step towards um, actually trying to embed greater financial discipline into what clubs do. So I think it's really, really important to stress. And, 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 and as I'm saying this, I'm thinking about Carlos Tevez. And you will know that Carlos Tevez, when he signed for Shanghai Shenhua in 2017, was reportedly on a salary of something like 660,000 US dollars a week. You can't sustain a business doing such things. And so I think what, 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 what the Chinese Football Association and the Super League have done together is to introduce measures to enforce some discipline upon Chinese football clubs. And, and my view is, is that, that such discipline is necessary. And, and I, would, I would endorse the attempt by the Football Association and by the government to, to moderate the financial performance, certainly the cost control exercised by clubs. I want to go to questions in the chat forum um, about campus football. I think campus football is a really interesting, uh, a really interesting thing. So I, I, whenever whenever I visit Chinese universities, I see lots of table tennis tables, I see lots of badminton courts, um, I see far fewer football pitches, um, and I think one of the things that, that China has got to think about is how 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 it, if and how it seeks to build that, uh, that campus culture around football that, that perhaps you've got in Japan. And as you will know, as, as, as many of you may know, in, in Europe, we don't have a football campus culture. So many of the, the, many of the young players who, who are signed up by elite, elite professional teams have played in grassroots football projects or they played you know, in local leagues at weekends. Um, it's 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 not very common, certainly in England, for university students to get signed up as football players. It just doesn't you know it just doesn't happen. You know, typically there we we have a we have a structure of amateur football. We have a structure of five a side football. We have a structure of kids football, uh, and so as a consequence of that, uh, this means that the talent pipeline comes from outside universities, not from within universities. Uh, one final question we've got. Last question. What are the sources of funds for European football clubs? Um, has it ever happened in Europe that a club has gone bankrupt? Uh, so clubs have gone bankrupt. Um, if you, I'm trying to think of a great example of a club that has almost been on the verge of bankruptcy. You know, in the last 12 months, we, we've had a, a team, Wigan Athletic. So Wigan Athletic, as recently as about four or maybe five years ago, was playing in the Premier League. Um, twice in the last 12 months, it's been bankrupt. It has recently been bought by an investor from, I think, Kuwait or Saudi Arabia. Kuwait, I think. Um, so one of the things that we know uh, is that the funding for clubs in Europe comes from lots of different sources. It comes from the Gulf region, Manchester City, Abu Dhabi, Paris Saint-Germain, um, uh, Qatar. We know that the Saudi Arabian government tried to buy Newcastle United last year. We then have Chinese owners. We have Fosun in Wolverhampton. We have Sooninger in Inter Milan. Um, we have US private equity investors at Liverpool, at Manchester United, at Roma, at AC Milan. Um, we still do have some natives, if we can put it that way. So the, the, the guy who owns Tottenham Hotspur, a guy called Joe Lewis, is, a, is a, 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 an English guy owning an English club. So money comes from lots of different places. Uh, what else have we got in there? Just quickly, Super League from the class view. Um, that's a really interesting question. European Super League from a, from a kind of socio-political perspective. That's a big, big issue. Uh, let's just say it's causing a lot of trouble. It's causing a lot of issues for football fans because I think sociopolitically, um, the Super League constitutes or embodies an ideology and a set of values that many people really do not like. Professor, what are some of the differences between working for a club and a, 
<clears throat> that's actually a really, really great question. Whoever sent that question, what are some of the differences between working for a club and, and uh, in La Liga and and um, uh, and, and elsewhere? Um, I'm an Anglo-Saxon, and Anglo-Saxons tend to be um, very instrumental, very economically driven, very target oriented. Whereas in somewhere like uh, France, for example, I think the French tend to be a little bit more kind of um, interpersonal relationships and networks and connections are more important. Um, so that, that, again, that's a really fantastic question and I wish we had more time to answer it, but we don't. But there are differences. There, there are definite differences in culture. Do big, big clubs also benefit from small clubs? Absolutely, because big clubs very often buy players from small clubs. So they are reliant upon small clubs as a, as a talent pipeline. If you go back to the presentation I talked about, you know, managing a big club is about managing a talent pipeline and small clubs are an important part of that talent pipeline. Wow, that was intense. That was intense. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. I wish I could spend more time. We're connected on WeChat. Can I just say one final thing? If you message me on WeChat today, there is a chance that I won't reply until maybe Wednesday because today the media has contacted me about the Super League. I'm just being bombarded and then tomorrow I'm working for UEFA. So it might be Wednesday before I reply. Thank you. Thank you.